Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you are miraculously changing lives. You want to transform us a little more every day. You want each of us to reflect Christ. You want us to be those fire hydrants of life-giving water. You want people to, to see what they've always wanted in us rather than disgusted and, and thinking we're hypocrites. You want us to reflect Christ. And that only comes by us loving you so much, not trying harder, but loving you more and letting your grace teach us to deny the ways that displease you and letting your spirit fill us through your word. And I pray that's what you'd be doing this week in our lives and never stop, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So he gives liberating power. Al Curley was wonderfully converted. He died of his AIDS, but praise God, uh, he took many people with him to heaven. And there's only one thing we can take with us to heaven, that's people. The next thing about Christ is in Revelation 16, it, it talks about in Revelation how the sun goes out and it gets dark. And Jesus said that he's the light of the world. So Jesus has enlightening power, but those that don't come to him walk in the darkness. This, Acts 26, 18, is Paul the Apostle's testimony. And he said when he got saved, God did seven things to him. He opened his eyes. He turned him from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God. He received forgiveness of sins and inheritance among those who had faith in him. And so what God did in salvation is he opened our eyes. Jesus became the light of the world and enlightened us. If you don't have Christ, you walk in darkness. That's what that horrible plague is all about. Jesus also has conquering power. Uh, these people in uh, Revelation 16, uh, as it says in, in verse 12, let me get there. It says in Revelation 16, 12, the sixth angel poured out the bowl on the great river Euphrates. These frogs, unclean spirits like frogs, come out of the mouth of the dragon. That's Satan. Out of the mouth of the beast. That's the Antichrist. And out of the mouth of the false prophet. So this unholy trinity of demon spirits goes out. And these are very strong spirits that deceive the whole world and bring them to Armageddon. Uh, 2 Corinthians tells us in uh, chapter 2, verse 14, it says that the Lord leads us in triumph. He ever leads us in triumph. And uh, he's the one that opens our eyes to understand the truth. And finally, uh, this last bowl, the bowl 7 in Revelation 16, 17, is poured out into the air and this huge earthquake comes. How many of you have ever been in an earthquake? Do you know what it's like for the ground to move? It's one of the most unsettling things and the Lord makes the whole earth quake. Why? To show that if you're with him, you're secure. If you're not with him, the whole, there is no security on earth. The Lord causes this huge cosmic quake to unsettle everybody. It says in Romans 8.31, nothing can separate us from his love. It says in Hebrews 7 that, that we are saved to the uttermost when we come to Christ. He gives securing power. The world cannot. Uh, this is what happens in Armageddon. All the, uh, actually, even though it says that the Antichrist is over the whole world, there appears to be divisions in that because the Antichrist comes from the west, the kings of the south come from the south, all toward Armageddon. The kings of the east come across the dried up Euphrates and come, and then the kings of the north. But everyone converges right there where all of you are going when you go on the Holy Land trip, uh, uh, if you go on the Holy Land trip. They go to Mount Megiddo, it's 60 miles north of Jerusalem. It's a site of so many events, right down to historical events. Uh, even, uh, you know, Napoleon was defeated there. So uh, that's what Armageddon's like, and you can read about it. Now we get to the final hour of today. And basically, in hour eight, what we're going to look at is the demise of religion, that's chapter 17, the demise of materialism, that's chapter 18, and the first half of the return of Christ in chapter 19. First of all, I would like to 
take this moment because so many of you uh, come to me and, and I, I always ask all of you the same thing if you're listening. You ask your question and talk and I say, what, is, what are you going to do with that wonderful life God gave you or what are you going to do next year or what is the Lord doing in your life? That's because of one of my favorite verses, Psalm 1611. Psalm 1611 says that God wants to be the tour guide of your life. Thou wilt show me the pathway of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are endless pleasures. So God says, I want to show you the path of life, my will. The way you'll know you're following my will is you'll have fullness of joy. Now here's an illustration. Remember, I think in pictures, phonographic mind. If this is a cell tower, I can tell how close I am to the cell tower. Oh, I only, oh. I have three bars. I only had two for a second, but it must be I got close to the bottle. It went to three. But uh, if this is a cell tower, you can see on your phone the strength of the signal. You all know that. And so, you know, if you don't have good reception, you go up on a hill or you hold your phone higher or you hold it out the window if you're in a metal building or something. You want to be close to that signal. What the Lord says is, in my presence close to the cell tower, your life close to the source, is fullness of joy. So I can tell how far I'm getting away from the cell tower by how many bars, how strong the signal is. The Lord wants to show us the path of life. If he's showing us the path of life, if he's showing it, if he's the guide, we're following him. You know, like in a car, you're following the other car. You stay as close as you can. When they turn, you turn. If we stay close to Christ, the way we know it is we have fullness of joy. So this morning, we could do a little test. You can tell how close you are to Christ, not by how happy you are or how sad you are. Those are emotions. How much joy you have. Joy is supernatural detachment from our circumstances. So you can have no money for your making your next payment. You could have no boyfriend or girlfriend. And you could have not a friend in the world, which is your circumstance, but you can still be overflowing with joy. How? By staying close to the cell tower. In your presence is fullness of joy. Did you know that when we follow Christ as our guide and stay close to him, he gives us the end of chapter 16, verse 11 of the Psalms, endless delights. Let's see. Okay, I have two minutes to tell this story. When I was in college, I was a, I was a ministerial student. There were 1,000 ministerial students. We were all given assignments to learn how to be a pastor. And they told the whole class, you have to go do a hospital visit. I'm in school, 1,000 miles from home, living in dorms with no car. Go do a hospital visit? So I said, okay. So I walked to the local hospital with my Bible. And they gave us a sheet, what you're supposed to do. It says, find someone in the hospital, uh, comfort them, listen to them, read the scripture, and pray with them. I didn't know anybody in the hospital. And it happened to be the week fourth. It was the week of Thanksgiving, and I couldn't go home. I even felt bad about that because I was a thousand miles from home. And so it was, I was doing my assignment Thanksgiving week, and I walked into the hospital, and I walked down the hall, and passed a room with the most forlorn person I'd ever seen. You know, forlorn means, it means they look like the world had ended. And so I said, can I come in? And they said, sure. Nobody else is visiting me. That's why they were forlorn, by the way. I said, well, I'm from the local Bible college, and I'm supposed to do a hospital visit, and I'm supposed to practice on you. And this person said, practice. And so I talked to them, listened to them, they were from Texas. Uh, they, nobody from their family came. They were in the hospital. They were going to get out in a few days. And I read the Bible and prayed with them. And I was done with my assignment. So I was walking out the door with my Bible tucked under my arm when they said, hey, wait a minute. And I went, yes. They said, the food's really bad in here. Would you go get me a Wendy's triple? I was a poor college student. Did you know I used to wash other people's clothes so that they would give me two quarters and I'd put my clothes in with them and they provided the, because I didn't have enough money to wash my clothes in college. So I would be their laundromat, but I said, I'm going to wash mine with yours. And so I'd go down the dorm with the guys and I'd find the one that had the least smelliest 
clothes bag, and I would wash my clothes. So I was so poor, do you know how much a Wendy's triple cost? <laughs> like $2. And I mean, I didn't have, I had like three. But, you know, the Bible says if they ask you, you're supposed to give, and so even your coat, you know, if they ask for your shirt, give them your coat too. So I said, are you supposed to have Wendy's triples? He said, no, go up the back stairway. He says, they aren't feeding me very well in here and they're starving me. He was a pretty good-sized guy. I said, okay, I'll be back. So I walked all the way to Wendy's, spent my $2, bought him a Wendy's triple, walked in, and he hardly said thank you. And I gave it to him and I thought, boy, this will be a reward in heaven. I shouldn't have told you about it. I just lost my reward. But if I hadn't told you about it, it would have been great because I didn't get any gratitude. So I'm leaving again after he's munching on it. And he, as he's eating his triple, he says, oh, wait, 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 wait. He said, what was your name and where do you live? And I told him and he put it down, he wrote it down. I never thought about it again. A week later, I got an envelope that was made of paper that's made from cloth. You ever gotten that kind of paper? It's really different. It's cloth paper. And the envelope was embossed. It had raised gold Letters. My name was gold with blue around it, handwritten, embossed on a thick cloth envelope. I'd never, I mean, you know, I'd never gotten a letter like that before. I opened it up and it was a stiff card. It said, You're invited to dinner on this date, be in front of your apartment where you live at this time. Wear a coat and tie, Carl. That was the name of the guy in the hospital, Carl. Well, I thought maybe he liked my triple, you know? <laughs> maybe he'll take me back to Wendy's. So I put on my, my only nice outfit I had, my, my marrying and burying preacher boy suit, and walked out in front at the, you know, five minutes before I was supposed to be there, and I was standing there, and you can imagine a limousine pulled up. And someone got out and opened the door. And I got in the back, and there was Carl. I hadn't told you that he told me in the hospital that he lived on a 10,000-acre ranch in Texas. They raised Barzona cattle and oil wells. And his family all had ranches around him. It was in the East Texas oil patch. And he was so upset in the hospital because they didn't visit him, and they had enough money they should have. And I thought, if you have all that, why are you taking my money for your triple? But it was a test. It was a test. So he took me out to dinner that night. I went to a restaurant I've never been to in my life before, never since. It had no menu, and we were the only ones there. How do you like that for a restaurant? Kind of scary. When we got there, there were five or six white, you know, white outfitted, towel over the arms, people that walked in, and they pushed in a cart, and there was an aged side of beef, the whole side. And the guy behind it was going with his knife. And he said, what cut of beef do you want? I mean, the only cuts I knew were the ones at Walmart with saran wrap over them, you know? <laughs> this guy had this meat, and he was going like this with razor sharp, and there was sitting in front of us, and I said, I don't even... What parts can you have, you know? I mean, I don't, I'm not from this world that you guys are. And they, they said, oh, you know, the porterhouse and the T-bone is here, and the this and this and this and this and this and this. And I said, okay, I'd like that. And he moved his knife and said, how thick do you want it? I mean, this was custom eating. So it was a nice night, and we ate. And at the end of the night, Carl told me, he said, you know what? He said, I don't have very many friends. He was a Christian. He was visiting friends who didn't visit him in the hospital. And the Lord directed for me to do my hospital visit and look at the most four. I mean, you talk about divine appointments. And that summer, I was going on a missions trip smuggling Bibles. That's what I did during my summers. I smuggled Bibles into the communist countries in northern Africa during my summer missions trips. And I was going over there to do that. And I was telling Carl about it, and he says, when are you going to do that? And I said, oh, this date. He said, what are you doing the week before? I said, working to earn money for the trip. He said, could I take you to Europe? 
on the way to the missions trip. He said, I'll take you to my favorite places. I said, sure, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> Dinner was great, Carl. Short story is this. We spent one week. We flew from where we were to London. We got off the airplane. We did not go down that long chute with all the people bumping along with all their carry-ons. Someone met us at the door of the plane and we went out a side door and there was a car underneath, underneath the jet bridge. We didn't go through customs with all those people. We had some come to our car and do our customs. We went to a hotel. We didn't check in. They met us, opened the door, carried our bags to a room. I never saw money transfer any time on this trip. The rich people, remember how both Clinton and, and Obama didn't know how to use credit cards. These rich people, and Trump probably doesn't either, they don't do stuff like us. They, everything's done for them. This was really great. Carl says, we're going out to eat and we're going to see a play. Okay, whatever you say, Carl. And so I put on, I only had two outfits, so I put on one of them, and I came down to the lobby and he said, here we go. And we got in another car, we drove up to the back door of the theater, and we were on the very front row of Annie in London. I could see her eyelashes. We were in a box seat. I mean, I didn't know you could get so close to the stage. Then he said, you're going to love dinner. We went to a place in London. I thought we were going to the aquarium. It was a fish tank from the floor as high as that wall. The most amazing fish were floating around in there. The waiter came up and said, uh, what kind of fresh catch do you want? I said, well, what are the choices? He said, I said, what? <laughs> they speared what you wanted and cooked it and brought it to your table. They had these skin divers that would go in. They had soul, they had how, they had all those fish in there. I went, oh, wow, this is how the other half lives. That was the first day of our trip. It only got more amazing. None of them use the front doors. None of them ever, you never see money transfer. Everything is set up for them. Basically this, Carl said, I want to be your guide to show you Europe like you've never seen. If Carl could amaze, I could, I could tell you stories the rest of our hour about that trip. It was unbelievable. Carl is a normal, fallen, sinful human being that got saved. And he showed me a dimension of life that I've never seen since. What well, was amazing. Do you know what Psalm 1611 said? The God of the universe that made every galaxy and every uh, creature on this world that amazes us and all the, everything around us and created us said, I would like to be your guide. I would like to show you the path of life. The way you'll know you're following me is I will keep you full of joy as long as you stay close to me. And if you follow me through life, you will have a life of endless delights. That's what God offers. That's what the people that go to hell reject. And that's what soul winning's all about, telling them about that guide. Well, true gospel is opposed in chapter 17 to religion. So in chapter 17 of Revelation, we find the contrast between the true bride of Christ and the false, which is the harlot. It says in 2 Corinthians, and this is in your notes, 11.2, I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So what the Lord does is, he talks about the mystery of Babylon. And Babylon is a mystery in chapter 17 of religion and a mystery in chapter 18 of materialism. And those are the two, two tools of Satan that he uses globally and has always used in history. First of all, Chapter 17, we have the great whore, a prostitute, dressed up, drunk, uh, wicked. She rides the beast, that's the Antichrist, with the seven heads. So she is somehow connected to the Antichrist. She's the mother of harlots and abominations, and she's drunk with the blood of saints. So that's how we know this is religion. You know, religion has always been opposed to the true gospel. It still is. Then, Babylon the Great is the city, and that's commercialism and civilization and materialism, kings, merchants, those who trade by sea. Most people go to hell either because they're deceived by false religion or 
They're deceived by riches, and they don't want to give up. Remember how Jesus told the rich ruler, get rid of everything and follow me? And material things are too important to them. Basically, uh, this is the second woman that's profiled. Chapter 12, we had the expectant woman. That's Israel. The woman riding the beast is in chapter 17. And so what it is, is this is not God is opposed to women. God is using a metaphor for us to see. Uh, and, and you can read that. It's in your notes. It's just fascinating. I mean, I, could, I spent 10 years studying this for my dissertation. But basically, we have come now to this, this conclusion of the, the whole chapter 16 and the, the deception, and then this the pouring out earthquake. Let me get that. Uh, after that happens, we find that God here is exposing Satan's plan. And so it says in 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, no wonder Satan transforms himself into an angel of light. That's what chapter 17 is about. All religions of the world are Satan trying to deceive people and, and be the light to light them to God. And so they don't, he's the angel of light that's deceiving. The 17th chapter describes the doom of the Babylonian religious system. The system is seen as a woman portrayed as a harlot. She's a symbol of Satan's world religion. So, what is Satan's plan? 1 Timothy 4.1 tells us, the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. So, what, what we're talking about is Satan's demons have always been trying to deceive people to counterfeit the truth. Now, if, if I took out my wallet and took out a dollar bill and I held it up and it was yellow, you would think either it had been in the laundry with bleach or it's fake. If it was red, you'd think, you know, either someone painted it or it's fake because we know money is green. You don't counterfeit something by making red dollar bills. If you have a red $100 bill, they won't even rub the little checker on it. They'll say, come on, that's fake. You counterfeit something by having it be as closely as possible looking correct. That's what religion is. The most dangerous thing is false religions. And that's what's revealed here. Revelation 17 talks about Satan's church. So who is this woman on the beast? The woman is in contrast, as I said, to the chapter 12 woman. And the woman is the apostate church. It's not just Buddhism or Shintoism or Hinduism. It's false Christianity. You understand that the, the most dangerous thing, I mean, Hindus are Hindus. They're not Christians. The most dangerous thing is a false form of Christianity. And that's what it's talking about. That's what religion really is. And the harlot is the apostate church. Now, one of the manifestations today, now let, hear what I say very carefully. One of the manifestations of the apostate church today is the Roman Catholic Church. Now, you understand what Roman Catholic Church is. Catholic is the universal. The original church started by Jesus and the apostles Jesus started the church built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets from the first century, written about in the Gospels, went all the way through all the persecutions and everything that happened in the martyrdom, and finally in the fourth century, Christianity was legalized by the Roman Empire, and it changed. The Roman Empire, the Caesars, had a pantheon. A pantheon, pan, all, theon, gods. It's a building in Rome. And every time the emperors would go conquer another nation, they'd tote back the god of those people and they'd put it up on the shelf. Rome worshipped all of them. And so it was, it was inclusive of all gods. Now the, the pope, or I mean the pope, the, the uh, emperor said, but I'm in charge, but all your gods are welcome. That was Roman religion of the Roman Empire. And Rome sponsored temples everywhere. And they, they allowed you to have a temple to every god you wanted because that's how they pacified all the people that they conquered. They got to keep their gods, they put their god in Rome, and Rome sponsored their temple, and it was all great. 
when Christianity got legalized, the emperor had a problem. He had all these Christians, millions of them, but he had all these pagans in all their temples. And what the emperor did is this. Where do you think beads, prayer beads, came from? Is that in the Bible? That came from the pagan side of Rome. Where did the burning of candles, where did the wearing of those all different colored robes, where did those funny hats that the Pope wear come from? Where is all that from? It's from the merging of the Roman pagan gods and worship and temples into Christianity by Constantine in AD 313. So what's the Mass? Do you know what the heartbeat of Rome is? The Mass, Roman Catholicism, the very pulsating heart of Romanism is the Mass. What is the Mass? Well, first of all, what does the Bible say about Christ's sacrifice? And I'll tell you what Rome says about it. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 25, it says this. Nor should he offer himself often as the high priest enters the holy place every year with the blood of another. Then he would have to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now at the end of the age, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And it goes on into chapter 10 saying he died once for all. 928, Jesus Christ was offered once. What's the Mass? Mass is the re-crucifixion of Jesus Christ on the altar of the Catholic Church, sometimes multiple times a day. It is a, what they call a bloodless sacrifice, where they again offer the body of Jesus Christ in his blood, and then they give it out. You know, they, if you've ever been to Mass, they take the wafer and dip it in the cup and put it in your mouth. And that whole offering, when, when the priest goes like this, and they used to do it in Latin, and they would take the host, they would take the, the elements of the communion, the cup and the bread, and they'd go, hocus corpus meum, that's Latin, and they would lift it up, hocus corpus meum. And when they do that, they have to do that. They have to go, hocus corpus meum. In that process, they transform normal bread and normal wine into the body and blood of Christ. Did you hear what I said? Hocus corpus meum. If you were out there and didn't speak Latin and you were in the Middle Ages and never had read anything or watched television or even read a book, you would think the priest was doing something magical because he took bread from the bakery and went, hocus corpus meum. Have you ever heard the term hocus pocus? What does that mean? Somebody's doing magic. The term hocus pocus is a denigration of hocus corpus meum. This is my body. Hoc this corpus body meum, my. This, those Latin words weren't understood by the people. They just said, he's doing hocus pocus. The mass is a re-crucifixion of Christ. Why do they do that? Because Rome took the paganism that comes from the Tower of Babel. Everything about Catholicism, Roman Catholicism, I can show you in paganism. Have you ever heard of Lent? How many of you have heard of Lent? 40 days of what? Lent, which follows Mardi what? Gras. What is Mardi Gras? Fat what? Tuesday. Then there's followed by Fat Tuesday, when you eat everything before you start Lent, by this Ash Wednesday. I mean, all this stuff. Where, uh, by the way, where is all that? Where'd the 40 days come from? It's not from the Bible. Did you know that if you were in Egypt or in Babylon or in Assyria, all of those ancient civilizations had the same kind of mythology in their background. That there was this sun god who put a sun ray down that hit a woman. The woman conceived a child and bore a son. And that son was killed. And after 40 days, he rises again. Now, what does that sound like? the virgin birth, and the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. See, Satan has built that story into every culture. In the Canaanites, the son that got killed was called Baal. Among the Egyptians, the, the son is Isis and the mother is Horus. 
in the Greek civilization, it's Zeus and Astarte. Every culture has a mother's son, a mother virgin who has a son who dies and rises from the dead. Every culture has that. And the, the rising from the dead happens after 40 days. So Lent goes 40 days right up until we come to Easter. That, I mean, Roman Catholics around the world celebrate this, this Mardi Gras, Ash Wednesday, and 40 days of Lent, thinking it's biblical. All that is is paganism. That actually was started by Nimrod, Nimrod's wife, Semiramis. Uh, you can read all about this in history. The origin of Romanism is in paganism. It says in Hebrews 2.14, Inasmuch as the children partake of flesh and blood, he likewise took part in the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. How will Satan's plan be extinguished? It's when Jesus Christ comes in and ends it, and that's what chapter 17 is all about. Jesus said, enough of this false religion, and he stops all the religions. And he just extinguishes Satan's plan. And that's what the whole 17th chapter is about. Uh, real quickly, what is the quiz on tomorrow? Boy, this will wake you up. There's tomorrow's quiz. Okay? Only it's going to be all jumbled, moved around, and cut in pieces. It's going to say, if you're talking about worship... Is it 21 and 22? Is it 20, 11 to 15, 20 here? Is it chapter 19 or is it 6 through 18 or is it 4 and 5? What's the worship scene in heaven? 4 and 5, chapter 4 and 5. Okay, it's going to be like this. So you've got to know these divisions. So if we're talking about the second coming of Christ, not the rapture, the second coming, what chapter is it? 19. What chapter is the second coming? 19. See how easy it is? So it doesn't matter. If I say millennium, you're going to have all these choices. All you have to do is just master this outline. The worship scene is 4 and 5. The great tribulation is 6 to 18. You can just forget about the verse numbers. They only matter right here. Return of the king, that's the second coming. Return of the king. The white horse coming through the sky, breaking out. You know, that's chapter 19. Remember that. The millennium, the thousand-year rule, is the first half of chapter 20. The great white throne judgment follows that. And that's the second half of chapter 20. And the eternal state, or heaven, is 21 and 22. You got it? Everyone say yes. That's tomorrow. Okay? Don't forget. Okay, chapter 18. is all about living for what's eternal. Basically, you could title Revelation 18 as the coming global financial collapse. I really believe, personally, that the world is just going to go through all these cycles of ups and downs, but it's going to keep getting more and more affluent. I know everybody thinks that there's going to be this huge meltdown of the whole world, but if you look at the Bible, the Bible says the end of the world is like the days of Noah. Everyone's eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage, which means life is going on and things are great. When you look at Revelation 18, They've got all the commodities. They've got all the comforts. There's great disparity between the rich and the poor. But there's all the affluence. And so God's going to collapse all of the commercialism and materialism. There's a cataclysmic day on the horizon in the future that will launch a series of events that will stop the life of everyday people on earth. In a single moment, on a single day all over the world, the food supply will end, the transportation system will grind to a halt, the banking system will freeze, and all the luxuries will end. That's chapter 18. God says, I'm going to show you, you cannot serve God and mammon, earthly treasure. Uh, what this is about, I mean, why? Think for a moment. The book of Revelation is the only book with a promised blessing of reading it. The book of Revelation was given to the church, not to Israel. Why? Why on earth would God show us chapter 18 if we're not going to even be here? That's a good question. You ought to ask that question. Why? Why? Because Jesus is saying, worldliness is bad. Have you ever heard him say that? Love not the world, nor the things in the world. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father. And whoever loves the world does not love and does not have the love of the Father in them. 
Jesus is condemning worldliness. Look at 18.1. I saw another angel having great authority, Revelation 18.1. The earth was illumined with his glory. These angels are so powerful coming from the presence of God. They just, they're like a, a little sun coming down. And with a loud voice, he says, Babylon the great is fallen. Why Babylon? Because in Daniel's image, in Daniel, or Nebuchadnezzar's dream that Daniel interpreted in Daniel 2, the head of the image was gold. In God's frame of reference, there have been four great world empires. Not five, not seven, not indigenous people, this and that. You know, all this political correctness is just to obscure that Babylon was the first empire that had global connections. Medo-Persia was second, Greece was third, and Rome was final. You say, final? Rome isn't even powered now. Did you know every part of the Roman Empire has had its day in the sun? Spain used to be part of the Roman Empire. Spain ruled the world for a while with their galleons. England was part of the Roman Empire. England had the largest empire the world has ever seen. France was a part of the world or of the Roman Empire. It was Gaul that Caesar wrote about. France, with Napoleon, just about conquered the world. Germany was a part of the Roman Empire. Germany just about conquered the world. You understand? Italy was a part of the Roman Empire. Italy had colonies all over the place. Turkey was a part of the Roman Empire. The Ottoman Empire ran the whole Mediterranean for 400 years. Every piece of the Roman Empire has had its day in the sun, but they've all declined. America is actually an offshoot of the Roman Empire. We have our legal system. Everything is so much like Britannica, like Brit Britain. We're just kind of like a little offshoot. But what's going to come back is a revived Roman Empire. And that's what the Bible talks about. And that's what this Babylonianism is. It's this empire building. Jesus calls saints to come out of worldliness. Do you see what it says in verse 4? I heard another voice saying, come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins. God always wants us to not be involved with the world or the things in the world. Saints come out of worldliness. Why? Because worldliness, God says, is worthless. That's what 9 through 14 is about. It says all your boatloads of your stuff that you want is all going to burn. It's all going to be gone. Why invest your life with what is just going to pass away? And basically, God shows the end of worldliness. Uh, it says in verse 20, Rejoice, O heaven, you holy apostles. God has avenged you. The angel took up a stone, threw it in the sea, and all of it was over. It's like he destroys the cities. Okay, that's just Revelation 18. It's an interesting chapter. What does James 4.4 4 say? James 4.4. 4. Who was James, by the way? James was Christ's earthly brother. Jesus had four earthly brothers. Joseph and Mary had four sons besides Jesus, who was only Mary's son, virgin born. But Joseph and Mary got married and had four sons and two daughters minimum. It just says daughters plural. We don't know if they had two, three, four, but they had at least two. So Jesus grew up in a family minimum seven, him and six others plus. The oldest boy was James. Jude was his brother. Jude wrote the epistle of Jude. James wrote the epistle of James. James became the pastor of the first church. The people who got saved in Pentecost went to James's church. Because even though he was an unbeliever during Christ's life, he got saved. And Christ came to visit him. He believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and got saved. Jesus visited him, 1 Corinthians 15 says. And James became revered as the brother of Christ and the pastor of the church. This book of James, the book of James, has 108 verses. And it has 54 imperatives. It's probably one of the densest command-filled books of the Bible. And chapter 4 is a sermon that James is preaching in the first church in Jerusalem. And he says, Adulterers and adulteresses, 4-4, four, four, do you not know that friendship with the world makes God your enemy? Whosoever, therefore, wants to be a friend of the world makes himself the enemy of God. A worldly person's identity is found in this world, not in heaven. 
James said, if, you, if your identity is in what kind of shoes you wear, what kind of clothes you wear, how good your suntan is, how you know, fit you are, how macho your social image, if it's in your possessions, if it's in your career, if it's in your accomplishments, if it's in your house, if it's in your car or your health, and you're connected completely to earth, that you're God's enemy. See, God wants us to be pilgrims and strangers on earth. He wants us to have a little disconnect from the culture we live in. And for people to say, why do you act that way? And you say, because I'm a citizen, Philippians 3.20, of heaven. This world is not my home. I'm living in a tent. I'm not, I'm not trying to live for every ounce of stuff and things I can own and control and enjoy. I'm living for heaven. That's the message of chapter 18. And the question for us is, are we worldly? And 1 Corinthians 6, I mean 1 Timothy 6, and you can read these, has what Paul writes down on behalf of the Lord as the, what I call the seven keys to contentment. Um, and, and basically in verse 11, 1 Timothy 6, 11, it says, uh, flee these things. Flee materialism. In other words, don't, don't upgrade and try and always have the very newest and the latest. Intentionally, I always stay at least one step behind the latest upgrades. Because I never want to be driven to be standing in line at the Apple store and camping because I can't live without the newest and latest whatever. See, we need to flee whatever form of materialism there is. Verse 12, cling to eternal life. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Verse 17 of chapter 6 of 1 Timothy, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty. The Lord said there's nothing wrong with being rich. I sat on the airplane once on a Word of Life trip. Uh, John MacArthur sent me on a trip to speak for him at Word of Life in Chile, in Ecuador, in Argentina, in Peru, all these places. And he sent me and I went and Word of Life ferried us around. And the whole trip, this man sat next to me on every airplane flight. And he wore bib overalls and jeans and Farmer John shirt, you know. And I talked to him. He was always watching me and talking. At the end of the trip, I found out his name was Don Hershey. That year, he'd earned $600 million. He had 24 million chickens. Every egg McMuffin, the egg was from him. You know what I mean? This guy was uber wealthy, and he was a Word of Life donor. And he's just a normal guy. I never knew he was rich. He just talked with me. He wore bib overalls and Farmer John flannel shirt. He was clinging. Do you know why he went on the trip? He had his checkbook. Everywhere he went, he was writing $25,000, $50,000, $100,000 checks. Because this world was not his home, and he was trying to give it away as fast as he could before it was too late to give it away. Pin your hopes on God, not on your money. Verse 18, give until it hurts. Let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give. That's what God says are the keys to contentment. Well, let's go to chapter 19 before we have to leave. We're going to look at the beginning of the return of Jesus. Basically, the whole second coming of Christ is preparing us of what it means to go home. And Jesus said this. This is Jesus talking about it. He says in Matthew 8, 11, it's in your notes, many will come from the east and the west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. You know what that's talking about? Jesus always described heaven as a banquet. Now, to us, a banquet, we go to banquets all the time. Going to the dining hall is a banquet. I mean, you've got all those food lines and those piles of food. Most of the world doesn't have that. Most of the world doesn't have that. Much of the world goes to bed hungry every night. So to the times in the Bible, a banquet was big deal. A banquet meant you got all you wanted. Jesus talks about heaven as a banquet where people will come from all over the world to sit down at a table. This table that we're talking about here already has Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob sitting there. 
So what it's talking about is a banquet with the saints of all the time of the world. And Jesus calls it a celebration. It, it says in verse 1, I heard a loud voice saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord. The second coming, when he's incinerating all the armies of the world, is a source of great joy for the saints. Why? Because Jesus is the one who gave us salvation and is judging those who refuse him. In verses 4 through 5, it's a celebration of worship. Look what it says in Revelation 19.4. The 24 elders and the four living creatures, those cherubim with all the eyes that are crying holy, 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 plus the 24 elders, all fall down and worship God and a voice came saying, praise our God. So the second coming of Christ issues from this glorious gathering of the saints, this glorious time of celebrating salvation and the, the true wrath of God against sin, and then it goes right into the consummation for the church of being married to Christ. Look what it says in verse 7. Let us be glad, Revelation 19, 7, and rejoice. Give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. His wife has made herself ready. Now, that's really interesting. We're called the betrothed bride. Israel is called the wife. Did you know in the Old Testament, Israel is called the wife of God? God is, Israel was married to God. We're betrothed. In heaven, we're all united in this incredible home he's prepared for us. And we'll talk about that more. But this is what I like. Keep reading it in verses 7 through 10. To her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen are the righteous acts of the saints. Did you see that? Do you know what you're going to be wearing in heaven? Part of what we're going to wear in heaven is what we are on earth. Daniel 12 says, Those that do what you were left to do and turn many to righteousness will shine brightly like the stars forever. Now, everybody is going to be in heaven that's saved. Some, 1 Corinthians says, are saved so as by fire. Bonnie and I have a home on Cape Cod. I pastored in the New England, bought it, and we've had it for years, and it's worth less than we paid for it, so we rented it out. One day, our renter was smoking in bed, and as they were smoking in bed, they fell asleep and their cigarette lit their sheets and blankets, and they burned our house down. I talked to them. They had to go to the hospital, and I said, oh, how are you doing? And they said, oh, I got out, but lost everything. And there they were in the hospital with little burns on them, and they literally lost everything. Everything in their apartment burned. I mean, they really did a good job of burning our house. Now, that house was, uh, didn't even have a basement. It was an 1890 cabin that, that bugs came in and the wind blew through. But Massachusetts law says that if you have fire insurance, they don't replace your house. They build it to code. It had six-foot, four-inch ceilings. And when they rebuilt it, it had nine-foot and ten-foot ceilings. So i kind of glad that person smoked, you know, because <laughs> it gave us a brand-new house. But what I'm saying is that person laying in bed lost everything. Some people are going to be in heaven that way. Everything they did in life burns up, but they're saved so as by fire because the righteous acts of the saints, our lives lived useful to God, is what we wear. So the question is, who do you love? Do you love Jesus or this world? Pleasure. How are we supposed to live? John 14, 21 says we're supposed to love him and keep his commandments because we love him. We're supposed to love like Jesus loved. How did Jesus love? He loved the least of these. The question is, if you want to have Christ-like love, look at element four. It's right in your notes. Love the unlovely. Do you have a neighbor, a coworker, a relative, or a roommate that's unpleasant to you? Show them the love of Christ. That's what we're supposed to act like. And the way we do that is, when we're clothed with Christ. Now, oh, I was going to read Isaiah 33. Someone found it for me. But if you want to look it up, thine eyes shall see the king in his beauty. Is Isaiah 33.